Hi, everyone. Welcome to Vandercook's uh, Masterclass Series. Uh, we're super excited to see so many people here. Um, I'm Tim Reardon. I'm trombone uh, professor at Vandercook and uh, super excited to bring to you uh, my new friend and uh, a man I've long admired, Mr. Ed Neumeister, uh, who's going to be talking to you today um, <clears throat> about a lot of different things. And, and Ed is one of the uh, most interesting and wonderful musicians with a long and storied career and I uh, I just couldn't be more pleased that you're going to have a chance to learn from him today. I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, Ed Neumeister. Uh, he, you know, he's very well known in the jazz world uh, as a pedagogue and a performer. Uh, he's been on the faculty of the New School uh, and, and uh, also the, uh, the, the the University of Performing Arts at uh, in Graz in Vienna. Uh, he's uh, been teaching for many, many, many years uh, and has a long history of uh, teaching wonderful students. Uh, a couple of them I know are in the chat here. I see Ken Wolf, one of uh, Ed, Ed was his first teacher. Uh, He's also been in uh, the Sacramento Symphony, uh, Sacramento, Sacramento Symphony, and he was the principal trombone there. And he also played in the San Francisco Ballet. So he's a performer who not only is a great jazz player, but has also uh, played in classical, played a lot of classical music. He was also in the Buddy Rich Band uh, and played for Mercer Ellington, who is Duke Ellington's son. And He's also, for those of you who know the New York Trombone Quartet with Joe Alessi and Dave Taylor, um, uh, Ed Neumeister was in that and arranged uh, Bartok, uh, the famous Bartok Quartet uh, that he did there. And um, he's also a Grammy nominated uh, arranger. Uh, he did a wonderful arrangement of Nightingale Sing in Berkeley Square for the Village Vanguard Orchestra. And he uh, he's also done orchestrations for the Batman movies for you kids who are who think, you know, who hear a lot of movie music. So you're talking about a, a person who's really made his career in, in music and, and uh, trombone. And I am very excited to welcome him. And so I'll stop talking and let you hear from the master, Mr. Ed Neumeister. Give him a Zoom, Zoom clapping. <laughs> welcome, Ed. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I think I'm going to start just playing a little bit. Introduce you to myself through some notes on the trombone. <clears throat> So that was just a little thing <laughs> that I invented in the moment. A big part of my um, working philosophy includes improvisation, and that was an improvisation uh, that I just, I didn't think too much. Actually, I didn't think at all. Maybe the best state of mind for playing music. And the first three notes I played just became the motive, and then I sort of ran with it. Um, now, I've been doing this a long time, playing solo trombone and improvising, and I consider myself also a composer. So I bring improvisation and composition together um, with the horn and often just in the moment, like I just did. Um, 
my my working philosopher philosophy my working philosophy as a performing musician begins really with the basics and what does that mean the basics I, I think for different people it means different things I'm sure in your mind you're thinking about oh yeah the basics um, but it might not be the same hopefully it has some connections to what I consider the basics so the very first thing is posture and as as musicians, as, as human beings, it's a good idea <laughs> to pay attention to our posture. When you were two or three years old, you had perfect posture. But as we get older, we start to slouch and develop some habits by imitating adults that don't have maybe the best posture habits. So I, I look at being a musician very similar to being an athlete. If you're an athlete, you're going to keep your body in shape and together. And I think it's important that us as musicians now, especially brass players or wind players, singers, but also any instrument, it's extremely important that the posture, I, I don't want to say proper, because proper doesn't necessarily mean the best postures, but uh, I would say organic. Um, so it's the posture that we have, like I said, when we're a child. And I learned it mainly from studying Alexander Technique and studying other musicians, and but also yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong. I don't know if you're familiar with these things. Um, and yeah, I, I came to that realization when I saw a picture of myself when I was like 19 years old, playing in a band. And I wasn't playing though, I was just standing there in between and I <laughs> my posture was not that great and I kind of went oh boy I better work on that and I have been now the other thing so posture uh, maybe I'll demonstrate a little bit but the posture is super important for most of the things we do in life sitting on on your couch watching television never mind not not that important but for any kind of physical activity Probably it's important. And then the next step for me is the breath. And especially as a brass player, but um, I've been learning more and more about the breath. And obviously without the breath, we, we don't live, for, not for very long. But there are proper ways to breathe. There are healthier ways to breathe. And there are unhealthy ways to breathe. And as horn players, we need I think we need a combination of the most efficient and effective, but also the most healthy. And um, the healthiest way to inhale is through your nose. And I believe, and I work on a lot of these breathing exercises, breathing through my nose. Um, it's scientifically proven, really, that when we breathe through our mouth consistently, uh, it's less healthy, considerably less healthy, than breathing through our nose. And people who snore have that issue. That's one side effect of breathing through our mouth. And I used to breathe through my mouth a lot, too. And the more I learn about this, the more I realize how important it is to breathe through the nose. Now. As a trombonist, though, sometimes we have to catch a lot of air in a short period of time. So for me, it's a matter if I have the time to take the breath through my nose, then I take it. In other words, before I play, before you play, you have time. Um, and then in in the piece, if it's a quick quick breath, then we have to grab it with our mouth probably, or sometimes through the nose. Um, and this depends on the situation. But I'm, this is something I've learned actually recently uh, about the nose breath. So I'm, I'm giving you information that's kind of new to me too. I mean, I knew it was always healthy, but I've learned that, uh, that it's really healthy, <laughs> important, healthy. Um, so I'm focused on the breath 
the posture and the breath. I begin the practice day, and what the way I teach is to begin the practice day, and this is the basics, uh, with a meditation. And I like 12 minutes minimum. And the first part of the meditation is just sitting or standing. I do both with posture as if you're hanging from a string. So, shoulders relaxed. And just close your eyes and observe your posture. And look around the body and observe the life in our body. Sometimes we don't, we don't uh, really go check out what's going on in there. It's, it's, it's kind of heavy, you know, a lot happening. And it's, it's not a bad idea to check in with our body now and then. So this is a good chance to do that. Look at the posture, the breath. And this is the fundamental, the, the main fundamental before we play. This is not music, but this is preparing for the music. And then the next step is the breath. And it's an exercise as part of this meditation um, towards the end of the 12 minute period or however long you decide to what during the first 12 minutes you're just breathing normally and watching the breath so you watch a posture and you're focused on the breath when the thoughts come in which they will you just bring your thought your focus back to the breath there's no dialogue you don't criticize yourself for having stupid thoughts we all do <laughs> Uh, you just let them drift away and you bring your focus back to your breathing and your posture. And as best as possible, we keep the mind completely empty. And then towards the end of the 12 minutes or after the 12 minutes, I like to use a timer so I don't have to keep opening my eyes to see what time it is. Then what I do is exhale completely really completely and then inhale through the nose from the bottom down here all the way around and then filling it up as if it was a liquid and at the end the chest and you could we should expand like this and then exhale slowly all the way 100% not with pain, but with a little enough kind of tension that we wring out all that air and then do the same thing. Like two or three breaths like this, complete. Um, there are other breathing meditations, but this for me helps me get focused for everything, whatever's next, but in this case for playing music. And then after this meditation, then we pick up the instrument. And once we pick up the instrument, it's interesting because the mind gets active all of a sudden and the insecurities start to surface and we all the baggage that's included with our instrument. So sometimes it's a good idea just to hold your horn or whatever instrument you play and just go back to that medita meditative state with the horn, so connecting. And then, then I start to bring music into the process. Now, I'm going to pretend I, I haven't really played a lot today. You heard sort of half of my, my warm up just a few minutes ago. Um, the next step is warm up, right? But I have a different philosophy about warm up than a lot of people do. And I have a different, philo or not different, but a philosophy, a working philosophy about practicing that's maybe a little different than some of you. Some years ago, I used to think practicing meant getting ready. I need to practice for this. I have to get ready for the concert. I have to get ready for the rehearsal. Get ready for my next lesson, whatever. And at one point I realized, 
happens that, well, a doctor practices medicine, and they're not getting ready. That's what they do. They practice medicine. And a lawyer practices law. They're not getting ready, hopefully. <laughs> they're practicing law. They're doing law. And, and I, you know, I, I kind of a little light switched on. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of the famous tuba player from the Chicago Symphony named Arnold Jacobs. If you're not, um, check him out. <laughs> Should be. And I, I get a big part of this philosophy is coming from him. It's not a jazz philosophy or some far-flung far flung philosophy, you know, from outer space. This is coming from the tuba player of the Chicago Symphony. And what he said, in addition to talking about the breath and everything, he talked about beginning your practice session with music. And when I heard that, I learned that. I never studied with him, but I studied with some of his students. I embraced that concept. And this goes back to the practicing. If practicing is doing, then what is warming up? If practicing is getting ready, that means warming up is getting ready to get ready. So I more or less skip those stages in a way, or at least come into them with a different point of view. And my warm up after the meditation will be always music. What that music will be depends from day to day. And since I'm an improviser, um, I often improvise my warm-up. I call it a warm-up etude. But I'm also a big fan of Bach. I play, I've played all his cello suites, and I've been working on his violin sonatas and partitas for, for years. Bardoni, you trombone players, I'm sure you know about Bardoni. Uh, or a jazz tune, if you're more jazz-focused, you can start with a ballad. And the idea is to start the day with music. Now I know some of you or a lot of you are, are teachers, school teachers. And I just want to interject that this is a philosophy, this is a working method, working flow that I've been working on more or less my whole musical life, which began when I was nine years old. How do I get this volume? Sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Judith? Yeah. How do you get the volume here? It's all right, hang on. Two horns situated. There you go. Um, I, I hit mute all, hang on. Now I got to unmute you, Ed, hang on. Can I, I can unmute myself. Can you hear me okay? Because somebody was asking about the volume. Are we good with that? We're fine. I think somebody just logged in and had an issue. No problem. Go ahead. Um, let's see. Where was I at? How did we do this? <laughs> I, think, I think they're just not. Did they let me in? Yeah. All right. So you get your horn, Rick. Patrick Benson or Malu, is there a way to... You know how to do it? I got it. We're good. Thank you. All right. We there? Kind of lost my train of thought. Um, oh, yeah. Warm, warming up, right? So what I do normally is create an etude. What's the def definition of etude? Now, I know there's, I don't know how many people in this room. I can't really see. But there's a lot of students, a lot of teachers, and we all know about etudes. Um, but I've found that a lot of people don't even know really what an etude is. So I'm going to tell you now. <laughs> an etude is a piece of music, that's the important part, designed to enhance one or more techniques. Very, very cool concept. And I use the etude concept in my composing and in my playing, in my practicing. 
Uh, so what I'll demonstrate right now, a short warm-up etude, which will include the typical trombone brass player warm-up. It includes long tones, although I, I don't believe in long tones, but I'll talk about that later. Uh, includes long tones, it includes staccato, legato, whatever. And I'm creating a piece of music in the moment. And especially for you, oh, I know where I was going with, I was talking about your school teachers. For, for me, it's important with every student and every class to gauge what they need and to, to, um, to adjust to what the student or group of students now, sometimes the group has a wide range, but we find that middle level. I don't, as a teacher, I don't have a curriculum that is for every student. Every student is absolutely unique. And if I do come in with a plan, I'm, I inevitably change it. Same thing with a class plan. Now, we do make our class plans, but we have to adjust, I think, to the situation of the moment and what the students really need. Uh, that was just a little sidebar about teaching and about how I think about teaching. I teach all levels, mostly advanced, but sometimes I have a, a high school student or two from time to time. Um, all right, warm up. Warm up A2. So it's the same thing that we would do no matter if you're a brass player, mezzo piano, legato, middle register, pick a key. So that last piece I played was in the key of C. A minor, C major. So I might say, okay, let's get uh, challenging and play in G flat, tritone away from C, G flat major. Warm up, A2. The idea is to make a piece of music in a tonality, a major or minor tonality. This is a great way to work on your scales, your tonality work. So this is connected to jazz, but I strongly believe that all musicians should improvise. I do workshops, clinics sometimes uh, with classical musicians we're kind of strict, I use air quotes, classical musicians. And I was doing a week-long workshop with a brass ensemble in Sweden a few years ago, quite a few years ago now. And we, I came in one day and, um, well, by coincidence, the TV, local TV station's coming in to uh, take shots of the, uh, of the rehearsal. And the, the ensemble, they said, so what are we doing today? And I said, we're gonna improvise. <laughs> and they all, in unison, they all put up their hands and said, we don't improvise. <laughs> I said, don't worry. Yes, you do. And in the end, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, they were all improvising in the style of Mozart. Or uh, so a real classical style. They were completely comfortable with that and ended up making some great music together. So we can and would do, should, be improvising as part of a practice. And I can tell you, at least for me, but with, for my students too, it's fun. It's a fun way to develop our musical abilities by playing music. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> so we're not getting ready to get ready. We're doing it. Now, um, of course, there are certain basics of music that we need to work on. 
um, uh, scales, arpeggios uh, with trombone, uh, what I call the overtone series, flexibility, and that should be part of our practice routine, but for me that's never the beginning and it's never the end. It's moving so that we begin our practice session and we end our practice session always with music. And then we take a break and we make some what I call musical calisthenics in the middle of, of the practice session. And then we proceed to music. Now I'm going to just ask if there's any questions at this point. Not yet. <clears throat> Not yet. I'm, I'm keeping track. You guys, as I said in the chat, if you don't know how to get there, I have, uh, I'll, I'll handle some and, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll field them and hand them off to you. Okay. So then I'm trying to run interference for you, Ed. I had one student, uh, I had one student ask if that was an alto trombone. I, I let him know it was not, but he did want to know what model it was. So if you'd like to tell him, I told him that's a small board jazz trombone, but they're very interested in your trombone. Um, I would, I would call it a medium bore actually. I think it's 508. It's a Shires Sterling Silver. It's modeled after a King 3B, basically, which I played for many, many years. And I played uh, on a Warburton mouthpiece, but it's essentially the same as a box six and a half AL. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, I also played on a symphonic horn, a Con 88H, which I still have and use from time to time. And I have several other horns that are sort of uh, spread here and there in case I need a horn. <laughs> We've also had some lovely comments about uh, your sweet and melodious voice, uh, that they like listening to you talk, which is great. I, I would have to agree. It's very calming. Uh, yeah. I feel feel all my worries draining away listening to you. Um, there was a question about not believing in long tones. That's what they said. I think that's what they took away, that you don't believe in just playing long tones, and if you could expand upon that a little bit more. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up again, um, because I know that sends a few of you into a, some kind of shock, right? Oh, how can that be? Um, what I mean by that is I don't believe in long tones, but what I do believe in and what I do practice is sound meditation. Long tones, you're just playing a long tone and it's more or less, you have permission to think about other things while you're playing these long tones. It's like, yeah, I have to do it, it's long tones. And so you are getting some benefit from it, but you're not getting full benefit from it because you're not focused on what you're doing. And at sound meditation, if we, every day we pick a note and we play that note two, three minutes or more, breathe when you need to and really work on your sound and if you're working if you're a more we say elementary player and you're still working on your classic trombone sound then that's what you work on um, I tr as, as a general rule I try to avoid thinking about what my mouth is doing and what my tongue is doing and thinking about all that physical stuff Although there's, there's a purpose or there's a time for that. But generally in sound meditation, the focus is on the sound. And if you want your sound to be warmer, tell your body to play a warmer sound and your body will know what to do. Nine times out of 10, let's put it. Um, and then, then maybe it's time if the, if the sound is still, shall we say, not as warm as you would like, then you might want to do a little diagnostic. And with the diagnostic, that's going in like the meditation I was talking about, but you go to inside, first the breath, and then you look at the tongue and what's the tongue doing? Where's the air going? 
how is the air going through the embouchure? Is the tongue getting in the way? Generally speaking, if the sound is not warm enough or is brighter than you want, that means the tongue is up at, in the way. So just like the doctor, when he comes to check, check your, your tonsils or your throat, puts that wood, little wood stick in there and says, say, oh, so it's the same, oh, oh, oh. It's more like, oh, oh. Um, and using syllables to open up. But with that said, if we focus on the sound we want, we focus on the music that we want to perform, and this is creating the intention before we play that we know what our intention is. We're clear with our intention. If, if your intention is, well, let's see what happens. Well, <laughs> good luck. Um, if your intention is, I intend to play the most beautiful music I can right now. I intend to be my best, to play my best. That's what you can do. It's impossible to play better than your best, right? But we can play our best. And how do we play our best? Well, number one, we stay completely focused on what we are doing. If you're criticizing, you're playing, while you're playing, then you're not in it. You're not in the music. You're outside. You're criticizing it, which is past tense because it's already gone and there's nothing you can do about it. So, Ed, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. We have a bunch of questions from some younger players Good. who are wondering if this is uh, the kind of thing that they could do uh, even as beginners, you know, or less experienced players. can. And there's a number of questions also just about uh, they're saying how do you warm up and to me the entire class is about how to warm up I think that's what you're talking about right now right is is using you know uh, improvisation so maybe you could expand upon that and think about some of the younger students who might be in here and say that they don't have to be awesome jazz players or know all their arpeggios and all that stuff to start improvising playing things that sound good to them and I had one more one more thing that you could maybe expound upon with that, which is, you know, how maybe listening not just to trombonists, but all types of musicians, expanding to other forms of art and how that's affected your unique style. That that would be a, a great thing, too, that students would like to to hear about. OK, let me see if I can keep that straight. <laughs> well, the warm up is is coming through music. Well, the first question is, can can younger players uh, use this and incorporate this into your practice and I would say absolutely yes now hopefully you have a private teacher and the private teacher has their way to do things and I don't want to contradict uh, anybody's teaching I'm just introducing another way to look at things and if you are, if you can only play three notes on the tr uh, whatever instrument, trombone, trumpet, why not just improvise on those three notes for five minutes and just play, just play. It's impossible, the beauty of improvisation is impossible to make a mistake. You might play a note that you didn't intend to play, but that's not a mistake. That's a gift, that's a surprise. It's only a mistake when you put your horn down and go, oh, well, I missed a note. That's when it becomes a mistake. It's when you acknowledge it to everybody around or even yourself. It's like uh, even the great masters would play a note that they didn't intend, especially in improvis improvisational music, but even in classical music. Uh, if you play a wrong note, a note that you didn't intend to play, you can't crash and burn. That That's it. There it is. You live with it. And probably nobody even noticed, or very few people, unless except the composer, maybe, <laughs> if they're still alive. Um, so the warming up is finding music, finding an etude that can warm us up. Sometimes that etude is a simple, uh, I will call it item from the Arbans or a section of the Bordoni, 
And for, I think part of the question was for other instruments too. I, I think this applies to all instruments. And when we bring improvisation into our uh, working session, this is life. We are improvising all the time, whether you call it improv improvising or not. When you're washing the dishes, you're improvising. You're not gonna wash the dishes the same way every time. Now you could decide to be more creative with it or, or not. Um, and the other thing that is important for me, I go back is to the focus. So you've heard me talk about meditation now a bunch of times. My goal in life is to be in a meditative state all the time. What does that mean? That means whatever I am doing, that's what I'm doing and nothing else exists. If I'm walking down the street just daydreaming, that's what I'm doing. As long as I, uh, I'm cool with that, you know? And if I prefer to do something else when I'm walking down the street, like turning it into a kind of a walking meditation, okay, that would be my intention. And this goes back to intention, which I mentioned earlier. Before we play a piece of music, it's really helpful to declare our intention before we play it. I intend to play this passage beautiful. I intend to play it really legato. I intend to play it whatever you're working on. If intonation is an issue that you're concerned with, then I intend to play this with a focus on intonation. I intend to play this with a focus on rhythm or time. I think uh, with everything we play, any style of music, I think it's important that we, at least one time as we are working on a piece of music, to, to declare the intention that you're gonna do it again focused on time, focused on rhythm. So that, that becomes the central focus. And we can focus on slide technique. We can focus on, you know, fingering, depending on what instrument we're playing, fingering, piano, violin, all these unique fingerings, these trombones, just the slide positions, utilizing the most efficient and effective fingerings or slide, tech, slide positions for that particular piece of music. Great. Ed, I have uh, uh, several questions in the chat about improvisation uh, for classical musicians or for students who've never improvised before. And they're asking if it's if it's hard. Uh, and also just to elaborate, uh, you know, how would you how would you suggest they start working on improvisation? Um, you know, aside from just, you know, a few a few notes, how would they expand outward from that? Yeah, as um, uh, Maurice Ravel, I think it was Maurice Ravel, he had, somebody asked him the secret to composing. What's the secret? And his answer was brilliant. He said, in this case, write a note. Now write another note. It's going to be higher or lower. Now write another note. That's composing. <laughs> and uh, with improvising, it's the same thing. Now I suggest picking source material for your compo composition or for your improvisation that you know. So if you happen to be working on a B flat major scale right now, then after you've played the B flat major scale up and down a few times and it starts to feel comfortable, let that be your source material for your improvisation. Now that's gonna be your in intended source material, but like I said earlier, if you happen to play a note that's not in the B flat major scale, it's okay. It's okay, there's no, you know, <laughs> it's, it's totally cool. And if you play the trombone, if you just slip slip down a minor second or slip up, then, then you're back at the right note again. So, uh, and certain instruments are easier to do that than others but we can always play chromatic passing notes when we happen to play an unintended note. 
the main thing is to just do it. Now, uh, beyond that, though, once you start to do whatever that is, actually, I think this is with everything, we need to start paying attention to how do we do that and what do other people do when they do that. And um, so when you're playing in an ensemble, when you're playing in an orchestra, when you're playing in a chamber group, pay attention. What are the other people doing? What are the instruments doing? What do the melodies sound like? And uh, so we can incorporate what we learn just from paying attention into our musical ability. We learn a lot from paying attention. As a matter of fact, I mean, for me, I can say I learned most, most of what I know from paying attention. I, I sat in, I was lucky, I was very fortunate. I've been playing with world-class musicians since I was yeah, in my early 20s. Um, but I didn't take it for granted. I paid attention and I learned, and I learned a lot. And sitting in big bands, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, playing Thad Jones music and Bob Brookmeyer's music, and playing in the Ellington band with that music and then playing in symphony orchestras, playing uh, Brahms and Mahler and modern pieces. Uh, this was a big part of my musical education. Now, of course, I was studying at the same time uh, and reading and analyzing and doing all the things that musicians do to get better and bring bring their music, I mean, it was always my goal to bring my music into the future. And how do we do that first? The first goal is to bring it to the present. Be able to bring it to now. So that's getting to a certain level. And then taking it beyond into the future. The future, we can use the intellect to take us to the future. And we use a combination of intellect and our intuition, our ear, to bring us into the present so that we're playing at a certain, we'll call it a professional level or a high professional level. It was my goal when I was younger just to earn a living playing the trombone. Once I reached that goal, then my goal became, I, w I want to earn a living playing music that I like. Well, this is a perfect, that's a perfect segue to a great question we had from Samuel Black, who's in the, uh, who's in the chat. He wrote, practicing for a gig and freely creating are very different ways of musicking to me. Do you have different practice sessions for preparing music for a gig uh, and or creating my own music? Or do you both create and prepare in each session? So in other words, do you, are there some practice sessions that are dedicated exclusively to working towards some sort of goal or is, uh, are, you, are you kind of being free in your, in your practicing or, you know, in certain days or do you do it all in one day? Is that a part of your day? Well, yeah, it depends on um, the, what I need to accomplish. If I'm working for a gig, uh, towards a gig, I just had a recording session <clears throat> with my quartet, so I was practicing my music, preparing, um, and it was it's a combination of of those two things. I want to be as creative as possible, so let, there's one thing working for practicing for my own like recording session, but went back when I was freelancing, um, if I was going to play Brahms in a symphony orchestra, second trombone, of course, I would work on that part. And I, as in preparation, I would play that part, those parts, probably all the parts, many, many different ways. I would research all the different orchestras and how they play it. And in my preparation, I might take it crazy, but also work super narrow and everything in between. Now, in while I at a rehearsal or at the concert on the Brahms, it's probably not going to be crazy, probably, right? <laughs> it's going to be pretty narrow. But my goal was always that I would contribute 100% of my musical personality to that piece of music. And I would give it as much personality as the situation allowed. 
So that's not a real creative situation, but I want to give it as much creativity, as much espresivo, as much soul, as much heart, not to mention playing it uh, proper, in tune, uh, in time, musically uh, appropriate. So for me, it is a combination of the two. When I'm working on a piece of music for a project, then I dissect it. I dissect every combination of notes, rhythms, and explore deep into it so that when I come to perform it, the parameters that I've explored are so wide that when I'm working in the ne more narrow parameters, then I'm much, much, much stronger, secure. If we only work here, and that's where we're going to be playing, then the edges are going to be insecure. But if we work all the way here, so I'm talking about anything, um, articulations, dynamics, intonation, plus musical expression. When we stretch and we're comfortable stretching, then when we snap back, we're stronger. Great, and there's another question about uh, that I think is kind of interesting for maybe everybody at all levels, since age does not necessarily mean you are more comfortable with doing things that you are uncomfortable with. If anything, uh, age tends to make you less experimental with uh, with improvising if you have never done it in your life. I, I don't know if you would agree having done it your entire life, but. Um, I think there's some questions about how would you go about someone who's nervous or reluctant? How would they, how would they go about getting started? And how in particular with that orchestra in Sweden, did you actually get people who were uncomfortable or might not have, you know, done that before? How did you get them to start doing it? Well, in that particular case, I brought them in. I went and played a duo, improvised duo with each of them. So I could react to them. We picked the key. I said, we're style of Mozart. And we played duets. And we just started expanding from there. So the term improvisation can be scary because we think we have to play some kind of Charlie Parker bebop, you know. And improvisation, yeah, that's one. But that's the, one of the most complicated um, situations for improvising that it is. That's super, super advanced, but we don't need that. Um, one of the things I like to do with people who are less experienced improvising is create a piece where we say, let's make the worst music possible. Let's just play really crap, you know. And so there's, there's that takes down all the barriers. And I'm telling you, every time I do this, everybody has a great time and it's never horrible. It's always good. It's always interesting. And then we start talking about listening and reacting and the things that you do as improvisers. But if you've never improvised, just go to your instrument and just start making sounds. <laughs> You know, that's fun. Just create sounds, just go wild. Um, actually, in my, I was improvising way before I knew what I was doing. I was playing by ear. I remember my first improvisation was on a gig. I was 16 years old. I joined the union and I was playing in bands when I was 16, 15 actually. My mother had to drive me to the gigs. Um, and we were in the middle of one tune and the band leader said, Ed, you got it. And that, that was my first solo, was on the gig. Now, I just used a little common sense. I knew we were in the key of whatever. And I knew the melody, at least, you know, we've been playing the tune. So I just stayed close to the melody and played in the key that we were in. If I played a note that didn't sound right, I just 
avoided that note. <laughs> and that was the beginning of my improvising. And then, you know, throughout all these years, and I've studied it, and I really studied composition a lot. So now when I improvise, uh, my, my intention is to improvise like a composer would improvise. So my improvisations are coming from the point of view as a composer. So the more we study composition, the better our improvisations, the better our musical abilities uh, are, will be. Very cool. And there's, uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of questions just about, you know, uh, nerves and breathing and things like that. And if, wow. if, that, if you're meditating, yes. So um, nerves. I've been there. <laughs> uh, it happens and sometimes happens when we, we're, uh, we don't expect it. Other times we kind of expect it. If you're auditioning, that's the time you might get nervous. Uh, I can just, uh, I learned the power of the breath uh, on an audition for symphony orchestra, the Oakland Symphony Orchestra. And I don't know if any of you've done uh, classical orchestra auditions, but you, you walk out, there's a room full of trombonists, in this case, like 40 trombonists, all nervous, all warming up nervously in the back room. And then, you know, your time comes and you go out on stage and you're the only one on stage, except a person who's there to tell you what to play. And then in the audience, there's a screen, a big screen and behind the screen is the committee. So the guy, I think it was a guy, he said, play, you'll start with this, it was Bolero, of course. <laughs> and I had a glass of water with me and I picked up the water and I was shaking like this. My knees were shaking, my hand was shaking. And I said to myself, there's no point in me playing in this condition. So I took the time. I went into kind of a short meditation. I took several deep breaths. Towards the end of those several deep breaths, I performed Bolero in my imagination and then counted myself in, picked up my horn, and I played Bolero. And I played it as good as I can play. I played my top level. Put my horn down, picked up my water, I was shaking again. And then the next excerpt, same thing. I did the same thing and I, I did fine. Um, so that's, that was my lesson to me of how powerful the breath is. Those deep breaths, three, four, five deep breaths while imagining the music that goes back to intention, right? Intending I intend to play this beautiful. Not necessarily perfect, because perfect is not always beautiful, but perfect and beautiful. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, it got me to the finals. And then they didn't take any of us at, in the end. But the finals were the same night, and that wasn't, that wasn't so fun, hanging around all day and then playing it again. Uh, but that, that was a big lesson for me, the breath. So if you feel yourself getting nervous, Take some breaths. There's a question that I tell my, talk to my students a lot. This question is, what do I need to do? What do I need to do now? When an issue pops up, and they do, now I say issue, I'm gonna tell you I don't believe in problems, so you know I, I don't believe in long tones, I also don't believe in problems. I don't have any problems, and I haven't had problems for years. Why is that? Instead of problems, now I will have issues that need attention. The problem is like, oh man, I got this problem. Ay, ay, ay. Issues that need attention is like, uh huh, okay, there's work to be done. It's not a problem, it's just work to be done. So that's another part of my philosophy, keeping things a little more positive, but it's just, and there's always issues that need attention every day non-stop basically um, but it's nice when they're not problems because problems just bring us down 
Ed, I, I think uh, people have taken a lot out a lot out of this. Uh, I, I, there's five minutes left. I, I wonder if you you know if you wouldn't mind playing a bit more for us, perhaps, and uh, um, you know just if you, this is a good opportunity for for those who would love to get to hear you play a bit, that would be great. And I'll if there's any final questions uh, after that, I'd be happy to. I think we've covered most everything that people have been asking. So if you felt like I missed it, please feel free to send it again. Uh, yeah, I'll play a little bit. I'll do a, a little demo. It's a little bit brass, brass, brass player centric. But I, I really love playing with mutes, especially the plunger mute. Um, so this is, I have a whole mute collection, but this is going to be just open horn, mute, open horn with the plunger mute. You know what that means in a minute, if you don't know what it means now. So that's, and then there's with a, a pixie mute. This is a trumpet straight mute. It's a little bit different when on trumpets, but similar. Now with the pixie mute, I have to put the tuning slide out. And this, with this, it's, it's softer, so you have to blow up blow louder, but there's a lot of color possibilities. You know what I mean? <laughs> Any of you got last questions or anything? That's awesome. Yeah, I was just typing back somebody who was asking something. There's a lot of uh, people saying that's a very cool sound. And uh, I'm glad that you played that for them. I will tell you that the, the, the way I got to, to meet Mr. Neumeister was uh, at the ITF uh, two years, three years ago now um, in, in Iowa, the International Trombone Festival, where uh, I think I was telling, uh, I was talking to Ed earlier and I was uh, working with the youth workshop there and I'd spent the entire day listening to trombone and I just did not want to listen to any more trombone. And one of my friends asked, they said, Hey, you're going to come check out Ed Neumeister tonight. And I said, who's that? I really just didn't, it didn't click. And, uh, I was like, I don't know, I'm pretty wiped out. And they said, come and come and check him out. And it, what, what I heard on stage was just a man on stage playing with that pixie mute and with that plunger mute. And it was the coolest thing I ever heard. I just, it, he just was, it was awesome. So you guys, you know, if you want to check out Mr. Neumeister here, uh, you know, on, online, his band, he's got lots of recordings out there. And uh, you want to tell them about any projects that you've got out or anything they could check out to hear more of your playing? Well, on my website, there's a lot, a lot to listen to. Um, on Bandcamp, most of my recordings are available on Bandcamp. I have a new recording out just recently with a singer and a piano player. It's uh, jazz, kind of modern jazz, whatever that means. 
And just uh, a week ago today, actually, I recorded my quartet. I was talking about that earlier. And this will be out later in the year, probably. But there's a lot, uh, a lot out there. And uh, you can always contact me. But this classical I, chamber music that I've composed and also my trombone playing several records. And big band stuff too, jazz orchestra. Well, I just want to thank you so much for sharing. You know, I talk about intent all the time to students, but I don't think I say it as eloquently as you just did. Uh, you know, the intent to, to, to have something in your mind before you play. So I thought that was eloquently put and um, I hope people were listening to that and uh, really did enjoy uh, this session very much. And there's lots of thank yous in there and your website was posted in the chat. If you guys want to scroll up, you can see it's at, it looks like it's at newmeister.com. Right. Thank you so much, Ed. You're welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure.